We turn then to Judges and chapter 7. Judges and chapter 7. I'm thinking of another life lesson and probably the, the greatest life lesson for us to learn to the glory of God alone. One Reformed writer says that all people do indeed show forth the glory of God, either consciously or unconsciously, willingly or unwillingly. Nothing is off stage in all of history. And the point is that in all things, everyone is on this stage as part of this overall plan and purpose of God. And just as we watch a performance and see that there is a role and a part that has been played by every character that is on the stage combining to the overall story, so within the world, every person, every event, every detail is all being combined for the overall story, which is to the glory of God. We do not always see the reasons and the connections as we view the dam bursting in Ukraine, uh, the 40,000 peoples who will have to be resettled as the waters stretch 37 miles away from the dam and influence towns, villages and houses. As we see homes being carried down and away by this torrent, we can ask, why is this happening? How does this belong to this overall purpose of God that all things are to his glory? But it is, and we trust this, and we look to God, and we believe that he is working out his eternal and wise purpose. This chapter reminds us of this in a very clear and definite fashion that God's purpose and God's actions, the, the, the working out of his purpose is to the glory of God. And what a lesson for us to, to, to live with, to, to help us in our mind and, and, and as we go through different experiences and as we view our world that everything is to the glory of God. We've been learning different lessons in this fascinating book of Judges, stretching from the death of Joshua to the rise of Samuel and including the book of Ruth set within this time period. We've been thinking of life lessons such as reaping what we sow, thinking before we speak, a crooked stick drawing a straight line. And by the grace of God, we come to this further lesson, to the glory of God alone, that in how we live, we are to seek to align our, our lifestyle with this overall drive of God, that all things are to his glory. Companies have mission statements uh, they desire that their employees will adopt the mission statement. We speak of some people who have accomplished that as being company men. They are devoted to the company. They have imbibed the mission statement of the company. They are promoting the company in every way that they can. And it's that idea that's to characterize us here as we study this chapter. We will see how in this specific instance, God engineers everything for his glory. And that overall purpose of God, we are to align ourselves with. That as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother, as a child, as an employee, as an employer, as a citizen, we live for the glory of God. So there are three ways uh, that we see here uh, that the glory of God is seen uh, in this incredible story. There's many more lessons to be learned from this story. We're just pulling out this one theme from it. In the size of the people, God is glorified. In the strength of the people, God is glorified. And in the sword of the people, God is glorified in this great story in, in Judges chapter 7. Let's think first of all of the, the size uh, of the people. The size of the people begins uh, in verse number 3 uh, with 32,000. 
So, uh, Gideon was really encouraged by this response uh, for his appeal uh, to help to fight uh, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the people of the east who had come over the Jordan, as we learn in chapter 6, and they had settled in, 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 in Israel. In verse number 33 of chapter 6, all the Midianites, the Amalekites, the people of the east came together, they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. The verses go on to say that the Spirit came on Gideon, he sounded the trumpet, and he summoned people to come out to oppose this vast army. So here is Gideon, and there's 32,000 that responded to his call. He was the youngest in his family. He was little known up to this point, but yet 32,000 have pledged their allegiance to him to support him and to follow him in this new venture. They have come from his own tribe of Manasseh, from the tribe of Naphtali, from the tribe of Asher, from the tribe of Zebulun, verse number 35 of chapter 6 indicates. So alongside of God's command to Gideon, alongside of the appearance of the angel of the Lord to Gideon and the miraculous sign which the angel made, alongside of the fleece being wet and then the fleece being dry, there is this added encouragement of 32,000 who are at his side, standing shoulder to shoulder with him against these invaders of his land. And just then, God says to him, that's, that's far too many people, Gideon. Such was the, the low, moral, spiritual state of the Old Testament church at this time. That if they won with 32,000, they would boast of their ability. In verse 2, chapter 7, the people are too many, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. And so God says to Gideon that he should announce to this group of 32,000, whoever's afraid, go back home. Now, I don't know what Gideon would have thought about this. Would he have thought maybe a hundred will go back home? And maybe even a thousand would go back home. That would be, that'd be a terrible loss from this 32,000. But to his consternation, 22,000 head home. There he's left with what was initially a, a wonderful encouragement to him. Deflated, weak, feeling his insufficiency. The word trembling uh, used in, in this chapter is, is emphasized in verse number three. Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. The word harid in verse number one. Gideon and all the people were with him and rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harod. The Hebrew word for Harod and trembling is almost the same. And there is this, this relation as the, as the writer records it. In this place of Harod, in this place of trembling, 22,000 trembled. There is this real emphasis on the trembling of the people. And their return home. Perhaps we get a minuscule insight into this in the events that have been going on this weekend in the heart of Rishi Sunak. As three of his MPs have resigned, Boris Johnson, Nadine Doris, Nigel Adams. How's he feeling this weekend? Three people who, who were there in his party heading off now sparking a, an election in those local seats. Gideon feels it. Those who had come to support him. Those who had responded to his call. It's a time of crisis, a time of need, a time of battle. But given the opportunity, two-thirds of them fade away. And maybe for us, maybe for us, there's a correction to our thinking here. Sometimes we think that God 
can only be glorified in a growing church. The church has to be growing for God to be glorified. And we desire growth. We work for growth. We pray for growth. We delight in new people coming to our congregation. We want growth. But a, a greater desire it should be the glory of God. Here is a congregation that's, that's diminishing. Here is a congregation that two-thirds have left. But in that diminished congregation, the glory of God will be seen. And perhaps there's a, just a little adjustment to be made to my mindset, to my thinking, that, that my supreme desire or supreme longing or supreme prayer item sh should not be growth, but rather glory to our God in heaven. That if it pleases him to grow our congregation, that will not be the be-all and the end-all of our aspiration, but rather that God will be glorified. And if it pleases him to diminish our congregation, we will still trust and hope and long and pray that God will be glorified. Here is a congregation diminishing, but God is glorified in it. Glorified in the size of the people. Secondly, glorified in the strength of the people. Now just as Gideon is recovering from the, the two-thirds deserting him, God comes along and says to him in verse 4, the people are still too many. <laughs> this has got to be hard to take, isn't it? This, this man, this is his first mission. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of second mission. His first public mission. And here God is, is taking away what, what we would naturally depend on. People and, and their expertise and, and their ability. It's just been taken away. Every crutch is being removed from him. That God will be glorified in this. And perhaps we've experienced that in our life. Through an illness. Through a relationship through an aspiration that we had, we have thought, well, if I get this, if I achieve this, I will glorify God. And those things that we've relied on and hoped for have just been taken away from us. And we're like Gideon at this very point, but the great comfort for us, the great assurance for us is that we can glorify God in that diminished circumstance and experience. And here it's happening for Gideon now. The 10,000 that remained, the 10,000 faithful, the 10,000 committed, the 10,000 who haven't gone with the crowd. There's still too many. And a test is, is initiated by God, by them drinking from the local river. And I think for the first time in my life, I've understood actually what happens here. Some commentators say that the two ways that the soldiers drunk the water it has absolutely no significance other than to distinguish the two groups. So the larger number of the, the soldiers, they knelt down and they, they scooped the water uh, up in their hands. The other small group of 300, uh, they were on their chests, lying flat on the ground, lapping up the water, the text says, like a dog. So some commentators say, well, th th there's nothing important about the, the fashion eh, of this taking off the water. It's just to divide the numbers. Uh, and God chooses the smaller number. But I think the, the manner of taking in the water is significant. And it's significant so that God will be glorified. The soldiers kneeling at the side of the river, scooping the water into their mouths with their hands. They were sharp. They were alert. They were watchful. They were careful. 
there was this vast army set against them and, and, and they, they, they were going to pay attention to, to what was going on here. They weren't going to be caught out in what they were doing. But the 300, they were more naive. They were weaker soldiers. They were totally consumed with slaking their thirst and they were lying face down in the water exposed to all the subtlety and schemes of the enemy that was them that God chose. The 300 weaker, lesser, inexperienced soldiers through whom he would be glorified. In the dream that the, the Midianite has, you, you see the, 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 the image that he sees. It's a, a cake of barley bread. A common, weak, ordinary item that lays the tent flat. Nothing flash, nothing spectacular, Nothing uncommon. It's not a mountain. It's not a flood. It's not a rock. Just a cake. A solitary cake of barley bread. That's the 300. Weak, inexperienced, naive soldiers. The strength of the people. It was weak. It was small. It was inexperienced. But God is glorified in them. Maybe you're sitting there saying, well, you know, this, this 300, this talk of the 300, it's all relative, isn't it? How many were in the opposition army? Was there 5,000? Was there 200? How many were, were in that army? And, uh, and the writer, he, he builds it up for us, doesn't he? You know, he starts in chapter 6 and he, he, he describes in verse number 33 all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the East came together. And we begin to think, well, that's got to be a lot of people there. All, all of them have come across the Jordan River. And then at the start of chapter 7, we have this opportunity for those who are trembling to head home, and 22,000 leg it back to their tents. There's got to be some opposition there for these soldiers to, to want to go, go home at the first opportunity. And then we come to it in verse 12 of chapter 7. The writer takes his time. Gideon's going down to the camp, and he's, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the people of the east, lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. But who's going to fight them? Who are God's chosen soldiers that will take them on? This vast, unnumbered crowd. 300 inexperienced, naive, Soldiers. 300 has been a, a famous number within military history, hasn't it? The 300 Spartans who, who fought in 480 BC alongside of the Greek army and fought to the death at the pass, fought against around 120,000 uh, Persian soldiers and, and then a local man uh, showing uh, the, 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 the Persian army a, a, a path around to the back of the Spartan and, and Greek 7,000 soldiers and those 300 brave and courageous warriors fighting to the death, making their last stand at that narrow pass. But these 300 are not like that. They have courage but they have an experience, a naivety, and yet they are the ones that God uses. Perhaps in the Christian church, as, as we think of our congregation and our denomination, 
these ratios are just the same. There's always a core of committed people. And in this case, the ratio is one to three. 22,000 go home, 10,000 remain. And perhaps within our denomination, and you can look at the minutes of synod whenever they come out, those numbers of attendance and those numbers who are at the prayer meetings, it's often a ratio of one to three. 60 at the morning service, 20 at the midweek meeting. And it challenges us, where would we be on that day? In Gideon's time and in Gideon's call. And where are we at this time? Are we among the trembling, the distracted? Or are we among those who belong to that core, committed to fighting the Lord's battles in prayer and dedication with his people? But while sometimes that ratio really discourages us, this account greatly encourages us. For God uses the committed core. And he is glorified beyond all our expectations through that small band of committed people. The weakest, the less talented, can be greatly used by God to bring him glory. He's glorified in the size of the people. He's glorified in the strength of the people. And he's glorified through the sword of the people. Now Gideon rocks up to this battle not with any conventional weapons, not with any catapults, cannons, nothing like that. He turns up at this battle with really unconventional weapons, with torches, with jars, with trumpets. And here he is, and he, he aligns his, his understanding, he aligns his experience, he, he aligns his thoughtfulness about this battle alongside of God's promises and God's assurances. And so he divides this 300 into three groups of 100. They take the torches, the jars, the trumpets, and they station themselves on the high ground around this vast camp of the Midianites, Amalekites, and the people of the East. And they capitalize and, and maximize the, 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 the frightening effect of this encounter. And so, at the middle watch, the text says, probably at midnight, when soldiers went off their shift tired and, and just longing to, to rest, and when soldiers were coming on their shift, uh, not yet settled in, at that very moment of the changing of the guard uh, for this vast camp, that was the moment they chose to blow the trumpets to break the jars and hold up these torches as if it would appear there was a vast army surrounding them. And God used that, that practical approach to create confusion within the Midianite people and to win a great victory. They brought torches, they brought jars, they brought trumpets to this, and the only swords that are mentioned are not the Israelite swords. They had no swords with them. They had jars and torches and trumpets. There are swords mentioned in this battle, but they're not Israelite swords. In verse 20, it's the sword of the Lord. He's the warrior. He's the champion. He is the one who's going to effect the victory. His power is here, causing this consternation within the Midianite camp in the darkness. And then in verse 22, the other sword mentioned is the sword of the Midianites. They awake. They, they're confused. The noise, the, the, the lights, everything see, seems to be blinding them and, and, and turning them against one another. And they take their swords and, and they begin to fight one another. And there is no Israelite sword present whatsoever. God is glorified 
and the sword of his people. As this year ends, we reflect on all the activities of the church. We think of what worked, what didn't work. We consider new ideas. We review our meetings for worship or singing or midweek gatherings or CY classes or doctrine class or reading group or outreach at Notion Natter in the nursing homes. Can improvements be made in the format, in the time, in the content? Can things be changed and altered? But alongside that, Above that, we desire God's working, God's glory, God's power to be coming. Gideon and the 300 soldiers were small, insignificant, but it was God's power that effected that great working. Gideon brought alongside his scheme, his plan, his approach, and God's great power effected the victory. What a life lesson for us then, to the glory of God and the size of his people. Let's be more interested in glorifying God than in growth. We long for both. A small boy asked me yesterday, did I love my car? And I, in the spur of the moment, said, yes, I I couldn't deny it. I love my car, but I love my God more. And we love growth, desire growth, and pray for growth, and want growth. But let us love the glory of God more. Reverent worship, faithful preaching, and godly lives. Let God be glorified among us. In the strength of his people. I remember a preacher saying, I'm a two-talent preacher. Now, this was a a prominent preacher, a a gifted preacher, a conference preacher, but he maintained he was a two-talent preacher. And and what he meant was, and he went on to explain what he meant, what he meant was that he was not a a three-talent preacher. He was not someone exceptionally gifted. Neither was he a one-talent preacher, the person who buried his talent in the sand and, and did nothing with it but rather he sought to take and refine and develop the the average gifts which God had given to him. And most of us are two talent Christians. And we're to offer those talents and be assured that as we use these talents and dedicate them to God like these 300 soldiers here, God will use us Bless us and be glorified in us. The sword of his people. Oliver Cromwell's motto was, trust in God and keep your powder dry. This is what he told his soldiers at alongside of this commitment to God and desire that he would be glorified and leaving the outcome to him. Just pay attention to your cannon fodder there and make sure it's not, it's not damp. In our lives, as we use our abilities, we trust in God. We witness but except a man be born from above, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We witness but except the Lord give the increase, we labor in vain. Alongside of our plans and schemes and hopes and aspirations, we look to God for his blessing. For his working. The Reformation adopted this motto, didn't they? To the glory of God alone. In their church order, in their church standards, in their practice, in their lives, in their doctrine, they sought the glory of God alone. What a thing it would be for all of us to adopt it afresh. Lord, help me to align my life, my aspirations, my values with your overarching purpose to the glory of God alone.